please turn to the hymnal, uh, hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. Stanford Law School. It is exceedingly unfortunate and frustrating to realize that Marilla Ricker has been all but omitted from American history. Even the most in-depth biographical sketches devoted to her life span a mere three pages, and the few articles devoted entirely to some aspect of her life are only a few pages longer. To be sure, Ricker's name crops up occasionally in anthologies about American women's history as well as in free thought literature. However, the challenge in looking at Ricker's life is to gather up all of the footnotes and snippets of history and biography and assemble them within the larger context of American history. Only then will it be possible to recognize Marilla Ricker's great and lasting contribution to the struggle for women's equal rights. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Unitarian Universalist Church of Farmington. My name is John Benarowitz. I'm part of the uh, Building and Grounds Committee and the Fundraising Committee. Um, uh, Reverend Leonetta Baglesi is not in the pulpit today. Instead, we have a guest speaker from amongst our own, Paul Bailey, uh, who you've already seen. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, Paul. That's right. Um, at this moment, I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors. You're free to join us in the lower level after the service for coffee hour. And um, there's also a new member table down there if you want to ask questions or speak with some members. Uh, for those of you that are unaware, during the service, we do have super supervised nursery for toddlers, as well as religious education classes for youth, school-age youth. Um, you can speak with our Religious Education Coordinator, Natalie Case, here in the second row, second row. Uh, if you have any questions. Uh, and also, if you need to leave the service at any time in the middle of it, uh, there are two other locations in the building where the uh, service is simulcast, that an usher could bring you there to that. Our UU principles begin with our pledge to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. As we are a welcoming congregation, we welcome into our community people of all races, sexual orientations, belief systems, and ages, including those who are fidgety and create youthful noises. Um, announcements. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> There's qu questions from the audience. I love this.
Yeah, come on. Step up to you. Yeah. Okay, okay. After the service, what's, what's the name of the... Uh, How to eat like a child, and if you want any flyers, you may... See you after the service? Maybe you'd be out? Yeah, all right. <laughs> it's a play, yeah. And that was a little tease. There's going to be an announcement about an announcement, apparently. <laughs> For the, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Good morning. Paul Danowitz for the fundraising committee. Next week is the big day. Uh, the auction will be held next Saturday. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, it's probably the highlight of our church year. Um, we get together downstairs for a dinner um, provided by Linda Brown and an auction, both silent and verbal, that really sets our um, calendar uh, for the year as far as social events. Um, for those that are visiting, um, it's $20 at the door. That includes, uh, as I said, dinner and wine and beer and all the fun that you can have. Uh, downstairs, uh, there are the auction baskets, uh, which are currently available now, uh, which is, includes a $100 gift certificate to Myers and a $100 gift certificate to Flemings and a lot of great baskets and great values. So it starts at 530 next Saturday, and the uh, verbal auction starts at quarter to seven, and it should be over by, I would imagine, 10. So um, if there are any questions, please see me downstairs, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Uh, and we have one final announcement for the day that's uh, not in your order of uh, service. The rest of the announcements are in here. But on a sad note, um, some of you are aware, but longtime member Dot Baggett passed away yesterday. Yeah. Um, and the arrangements are, I believe, set. Uh, Leonette had said, I think, that as of now, tentative. And you'll find the final, uh, final arrangements and details in an email that would go out to the members tomorrow. But it's 11 a.m. Wednesday here. That's what I've been told. So, and it'll be, watch for the email confirmation. But uh, Now please turn to hymn number 95, There Is More Love Somewhere.
this is our sacred time and space to renew our spirits, to explore the mystery, and to share our joys and sorrows. With you, I find strength. With me, you can share your deepest self. We share triumphs. We share failures. We share joy. We share sorrow. So 
there's like the earliest skeleton where he walked on land, and there's like, you, you can see the development of how the skeleton changed, and now we have whales like we know them today that, that swim in the water and they move like this, right? And they don't have any feet. But they evolved from the one that might have been a dinosaur. I think I might have saw it in a picture yeah. or somewhere. I might have saw that thing that might have been the first time. Yeah. And so, yes, yes, so that's, yes, that's, that's <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like whale word. So, well, hold on, hold on a second. Hold on a second, though. So we found, we found a missing part of the story about whales. But why would that be important? This is where our hypothesis, our scientists have to find Evolution takes no. more than 1,000 years. It does, yeah, it takes a long time, right? You're digging for the bones? Good. Well, <laughs> I'm I'm up, 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 up here, are there, does anybody have any ideas of why it would be important? Like, why? how does that, knowing that part of the story, I discovered a change, change things? <laughs> How, how would that affect how we live today? Any ideas? <coughs> uh, by evolution, because I mean, like, we used to be like a. Why do we talk to We used to be like a wacky ape thing. We evolved to humans. So here's. Do you want to. Nobody's sharing, so I might as well. So Dante was um, advertising the play that he's in, um, so we're really excited about that. Um, we've also had a, just a really good month for, for Dante, really. He's um, going to be Tiny Tim in Christmas Carol, and that'll be um, the day after Thanksgiving. 
at the um, at the Bonstell, and that'll run till um, middle of December. And then um, he also has a national commercial. Um, if you watch any cable stations, um, he'll be uh, on a sharper image commercial that'll also run um, between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So, some fun stuff for him. Yeah, <laughs> we're grateful for that. I'm Barb Eglinton, and my cousin Dan Krebs has been diagnosed with cancer in pretty late stages, so um, I'm going to light a candle for him. My dear friend Dolly Nemeth passed away recently. We give generously to support this church where love, justice, and equality inspire our acts of service and compassion. We dedicate these gifts to all that we stand for within the Unitarian Universalist tradition. reading is from the book The Elect, Albert Hubbard's Selected Writings, Part 5. There is no habeas corpus for the person without a lawyer, and there is no lawyer for you if you have no money. Justice is a commodity, and the price is high. You are behind steel bars. As you stand there shivering, grasping the bars for support, someone touches your arm. It is a woman who speaks to you. She surely is not a prisoner, and how she got inside the cage you do not know. A singular-looking woman, tall, mannish, commanding, with iron-gray hair. 
Don't lose heart, she says. When your name is called, I will be there. She makes a note in her book and passes on to someone else. Finally, a hoarse voice calls your name and you stagger out before the judge. All you know is that your good angel of freedom is standing there saying, Your Honor, I appear for this person and ask for a jury trial. I also request that bail be fixed. Who is this woman? She is Marilla, Marilla Ricker. She has no predecessors. She never will have a successor, and she has no duplicates. Marilla has had no time to make money. In fact, she has turned it away to defend men and women who had neither money nor friends. She is one with the weak, the defenseless, the fallen, those who grope their devious way and stumble, or who slip and fall in the mirror. She has no word of blame or censure for anyone. She does not ask the evildoer to repent. She asks them to forget. She shakes none of your misdeeds before you. She says, if you have been a fool, forget it, for the world never will until you do. The life business of Marilla has been to be a friend to the friendless. People who have no friends are those who need them, she often says. She has devoted her life to the defense of women. Most of her clients have been women, and much of her business has been to collect debts due to working women by rogues in high places who sought to defraud them. I'd like to thank the Sunday Services Committee for the opportunity to speak today. It is indeed an honor. The daughter of Jonathan and Hannah Marks, Marilla Marks, was born March 18, 1840 on the family farm in New Durham, New Hampshire. 
She was the second of four children. Her father was a free thinker, her mother a devout free will Baptist. Just 30 years before Marilla's birth, women's educational opportunities were dismal and without much hope of progress. Only girls from very wealthy families received extended schooling, which consisted largely of such pursuits as embroidery, French, singing, and playing the harpsichord. In essence, these girls received an education in the arts of attracting and pleasing a husband. A prominent male philosopher, John Jacques Rousseau of the time said, the whole education of women ought to be relative to men, to please them, to make themselves loved and honored by them, to educate them when young, to care for them when grown, to counsel them, to console them, and to make life sweet and agreeable to them. These are the duties of women at all times and what should be taught them from their infancy. Fortunately, by the time Marilla was born, agitation and initiative by women such as Emma Willard and Frances Wright of New York and Mary Lyon of Massachusetts had distinctly altered the availability and scope of women's education. Marilla showed her independence at a very early age. She watched her siblings dress up on Sunday and follow their mother to church. Marilla refused to go, choosing instead to stay at home and help her father with chores. When her mother wanted the children to kneel and pray at night, Marilla refused. Her mother would say, Marilla, you are just like your father. And Marilla would say, yes, Hannah, she called her mother by her first name, but you gave me my father and I am entirely satisfied with him. There were only four months of schooling each year in Marilla's district. When there was no school, she would walk two miles to a school in session. Marilla's mother taught her to read. Her father taught her to think for herself. He took her to town meetings and sessions of the local court. Marilla recalled a sermon on hell at her mother's church. Now we will look into hell. It is all red-hot iron. Streams of burning pitch and sulfur run through it. Lift up your eyes to the roof of hell. It is like a sheet of blazing fire. Torrents of fire and brimstone are rained down. The fire of hell burns the devils, but it will burn the body as well as the soul. Listen to the terrific noise of hell to the horrible uproar of countless millions of tormented creatures, mad with the fury of hell. Above all, you hear the roaring of the thunder of God's anger, which shakes hell to its foundations. Little children, if you go to hell, there will be a devil at your side to strike you. How will you feel after you have been struck every minute for a hundred millions of years? Look into the inner room of hell and see a girl of 16. She stands in the middle of a red-hot floor. Her feet are bare. Sleep can never come to her. She can never forget for one moment in all the eternity of years. This description of hell went on for nearly two hours. Is it any wonder that Marilla, a child of 10, said to her father, I hate my mother's church, I will not go there again. <laughs> Marilla recalled that Sylvanus Cobb, a universalist, preached in an adjoining town. My father and I went to hear him. His sermon caused a great commotion, and a good old Baptist elder calling on my mother soon afterwards said, there has been a wicked man about here, preaching that everybody is to be saved. But Sister Young, let us hope for better things. <laughs> At the age of 15, Marilla entered Colby Academy to receive her teacher's training. At 16, she began teaching in the local New Durham District Schools and quickly earned a reputation as a good disciplinarian and a born teacher. It was common practice to have the children read from the Bible each morning, but
but Marilla had her students read Emerson and other modern thinkers. This upset the school committee, and they came to see her. They told her she must have the children read from the Bible. The next morning, Marilla said to her students, we will now read the startling and truthful account of Jonah whilst he was a sojourner in the submarine hotel. <laughs> On May 19, 1863, at age 23, Marilla married John Ricker of Madbury, New Hampshire. They settled in Dover, where John ran a large real estate business. He was an intelligent and wealthy farmer who, like Marilla's father, believed in equality regardless of sex. John was 56, a 33-year age difference. Five years later, he died, leaving Marilla a very wealthy widow, $50,000 plus property, at that time a fortune. Upon marriage, Marilla suffered the same fate as all married women, civil death, having no right to property and no legal entity or existence apart from their husbands. With widowhood came a civil resurrection in terms of the ability to hold title to property and enter into contracts. Remarriage would mean the loss of legal independence, but would also result in the loss of her inheritance to a new husband. An active suffrage proponent, Marilla demanded the right to vote in New, New Durham, New Hampshire in 1870 as an elector under the 14th Amendment. Her first ballot was invalidated, but the following year she had the distinction of being the first woman to cast a ballot in a state election. Marilla showed up at every federal election for 50 years, but was not allowed to vote. She asserted that no judge would refuse to sentence a woman for a crime because the statute said he. She argued how could the word he include women in the laws regarding penalties but exclude women in laws regarding rights and privileges. So long as women are hanged under the laws, they should have a voice in making them. In 1872, Marilla traveled to Europe where she spent four years, becoming fluent in German, Italian, and French. Upon her return from Europe, having decided upon the law as her tool to help the weak and oppressed, she settled in Washington, D.C., and began to read law. She studied law with Albert Gallatin Riddle, who was very liberal and progressive for his time. After four years of study, the New York Daily Tribune reported, on May 12, 1882, Mrs. M. M. Ricker was admitted to the bar of the District of Columbia. She passed the best examination among 18 applicants, all men but herself. Marilla was found to be particularly well-versed in the law of real property, a branch supposed to be beyond the reach of the female intellect. She made weekly Sunday visits to the district's jails. She brought books, writing materials, and other comforts for the prisoners. Marilla conducted classes in the district for the Wimmo Dossus, a ladies' club whose name came from the letters of wife, mother, daughter, sister, Wimmo Dossus. The club sponsored libraries and helped women gain education. Her first court appearance was the 1883 Star Route mail fraud trial. She was Robert Ingersoll's assistant defense counsel. The not guilty verdict earned her the respect of the Washington, D.C. legal community. In 1879, Marilla sought a hearing before the New Hampshire governor to protest conditions endured by prisoners in the state prison. She instigated new legislation so that prisoners could send sealed letters of protest about conditions to the governor without first being opened by the warden. In 1882, President Chester Arthur appointed Marilla notary public in the District of Columbia. Imagine, women couldn't be notaries. She had to be appointed by the President of the United States. 
she put the rare privilege of being a woman notary to effective use by enabling prisoners to make their depositions before her rather than before other city notaries whom they could not afford to pay. In 1884, Marilla became the first woman appointed commissioner and examiner in chancery by judges from the Supreme Court of the District of Columbia. She used her position for the benefit of prisoners. First, she challenged the district's Poor Convicts Act, under which several court judges, and especially the judge of the police court, had been in the habit of sentencing petty offenders to a short term in jail and supplementing it with a fine which a pauper could not pay and was therefore held in jail for an indefinite length of time. She secured a judgment from the district's Supreme Court declaring the additional fine illegal. In, 18, in 1890, Marilla became the first woman to apply for admission to the New Hampshire bar she petitioned the New Hampshire Supreme Court for the right of women to practice law in New Hampshire after she was denied because of her gender. With all justices concurring, she won the right women lawyers have today. The New Hampshire Supreme Court held that women may be attorneys at law and eligible for admission to the state bar upon taking and passing the examination or in Marilla's case, upon submitting evidence of admission and sufficient practice in another state. On May 11, 1891, Marilla was admitted to practice before the United States Supreme Court. She was the ninth woman to be admitted. Marilla wrote President McKinley expressing her interest in the post of envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to Columbia. Choosing to ignore gender, she based her application on skills and experience only. As a respected, experienced lawyer, she had the necessary legal background. She had traveled in Europe extensively and had become fluent in German, Italian, and French and was eager to learn Spanish. Women's suffrage clubs across the country quickly backed her appointment. Both New Hampshire senators and many Republicans endorsed her. The Boston Post wrote an article summarizing her career and detailing her qualifications for the Post. The New York Times said, except for the extreme novelty of the idea, it would be hard to find insuperable objections to the appointment. The president ignored the recommendations and endorsements. The letter turning her down arrived addressed to Marilla M. Ricker Esquire and began, Dear Sir. <laughs> Marilla said her primary motive in applying was to open the foreign service to women, for there is no gender in brain, and it is time to do away with the silly notion there is. Marilla was involved in one way or another through every step of the march towards national women's suffrage. She helped with local New Hampshire campaigns, spoke at national suffrage conventions across the country, and was a large contributor. She was a life member of the merged National American Woman Suffrage Association. The all-female District of Columbia Law Office of Belva Lockwood, Marilla Ricker and Lavina Dundo was known as the Three Graces, and when Belva ran for president, Marilla took time off to support her campaign. And from an article in the Granite Monthly, February 1909, a plea for equal suffrage, Marilla said, it is surprising that there are women who are unusually bright in many ways but seem contented with the position they occupy as non-citizens and political non-entities, content to be politically dead. There is the contentment of ignorance and the contentment of indolence. In the old slave days, when Lincoln was told that the slaves did not want their freedom, he replied, if they are so ignorant as that, they certainly need it. I want to call the attention of all working women 
to the disadvantages of disfranchisement, the facts collected by the Special Committee on Salaries of the National Educational Association show that in 467 cities of the 70,230 teachers, all but 15,000 are women. The average yearly salary of teachers in elementary schools is for women $970, for men $1,542. So you see that the disability of disfranchisement costs the women $572 each per annum. The sole cause for this difference in wages for the same kind and quantity of labor is the disfranchisement of women it is shown by the fact that in the states where women vote, their wages are the same as men for the same work and it is illegal to make any distinction in salaries of any persons in the public service on account of sex. It seems to me that any woman who opposes equal suffrage has no more sense than the billy goat had that butted the hornet's nest. In 1910, Marilla became the first woman in New Hampshire to run for governor. She offered as one of her reasons for running to get people into the habit of thinking of women as governors. People have to think about a thing for several centuries before they can get acclimated to the idea. Again, from the Granite Monthly, June 1910, the most unique candidacy ever known in New Hampshire political life is that presented this year by Marilla Ricker of Dover. She has been known for a generation as a leading advocate and exponent of the women's suffrage cause in this country. The Truth Seeker magazine said, Marilla is the intellectual equal of any man ever elected to the office of governor of New Hampshire. The Concord Evening Monitor said, at every stage of her illustrious career, she has been a determined and intrepid fighter along all possible pathways of upward progress. The Portsmouth Times said, Marilla could fill the governor's chair with credit to herself and honor to the Granite State. The Attorney General ruled her ineligible to run as she was not eligible to vote. But in fact, the only constitutional requirements were must be inhabitant of the state for seven years and be 30 years old, both of which she fully met with a goodly margin over. Marilla sought to challenge public perception of women in politics and professions, and she succeeded in two distinct ways. First, by gaining entrance for herself and other women to the legal profession, and second, by pushing the envelope with her attempts to become the first woman to hold the position of ambassador in the office of governor. Her life has been a struggle and a fight, a fight to give freedom to others, and in giving freedom to others, she has achieved freedom for herself. She has practiced law for 40 years, and most of it has been in defense of accused people. Guilty or not guilty means little to Marilla. We are all guilty, she says, for we have thought the thing, and this person possibly was rash enough to do it. Had we been born under the same conditions and lived in the same environment, we would have done the same. Marilla knows the best and the worst, and yet she neither believes in God nor devil. In her belief, there is no heaven nor hell, save as we create them for ourselves every day. Elbert Hubbard said, I once heard Marilla at the end of a trial say, Your Honor and gentlemen of the jury, I follow the example of the learned counsel on the other side and submit the case without argument. It should be explained that the learned counsel on the other side had made a speech two hours long and had worn everybody's nerves to a frazzle. The jury laughed, the judge snickered, buried his nose in a book, and then stood up and ordered a no lay pro in favor of Mar Marilla's client. Marilla also said the belief in everlasting life was first evolved by savages and then taken up by priests who promised an endless life of joy to all who observed their edict, who obeyed their edicts. 
It is a most selfish and harmful doctrine, and by turning man's attention from this world to another has blocked progress at least a thousand years. Ninety years after her attempt to run for governor was disallowed, a bill was passed in New Hampshire. Mrs. Ricker, with vision and the courage to persevere in the face of enormous odds, unjust law, and unpopular public opinion, lived a life that changed the course of history for New Hampshire for the benefit of all people. Opening with those words, the bill called for a portrait of Marilla to be obtained and displayed in a place of honor in the State House, but provided no funds for the project. The League of Women Voters of New Hampshire and the Women's Bar Association of New Hampshire raised $10,000 to have a painting made and framed by Vermont artist Kate Gridley, and on May 16, 2016, the unveiling ceremony took place. Marilla Ricker's portrait now hangs in a place of honor in the New Hampshire State House, and a picture of that is on your order of service. Marilla was rewarded with the greatest victory of all when she lived to see the 19th Amendment ratified three months before her death. In her lifetime, she not only lived to see the coming of a new age for women's political rights and professional opportunities, she made that new age possible. Today in New Hampshire, the Marilla M. Ricker Achievement Award is presented annually to women lawyers who have achieved professional excellence or paved the way to success for other women lawyers or advanced opportunities for women in the legal profession or performed exemplary service on behalf of women. Marilla's life has been devoted to the defense of women. Most of her clients have been women. She was not concerned that many of those she helped did not show gratitude. People who expect gratitude, she said, do not deserve it. She did her work and forgot it. She said a good memory is a fine thing, but a fine forgettery is a finer. <laughs> Women of the town would cross the street to kiss her cheek and say, God love you, Marilla. Boot blacks, shoe shiners, would follow after her and say, Let me carry your satchel, Marilla. It won't cost you nothing. She said, If you must believe in something, believe in yourselves, in your senses and your minds. To accept a religious creed is to accept another's mind in place of your own. When religious belief comes in, brains go out. We are living in the 20th century of what is called the Christian era, and we have not outgrown the superstitions of the first century. A religion that promises a heaven of idleness for all those who agree with us and a hell for those who do not, I regard as barbaric, degrading, and unworthy. What I know about the Universalists I like. They seem to think we are all in the same boat and that one stands as good a chance as another, of which I approve. I believe that the Unitarians as a class think for themselves. I approve of that. The Evangelical Alliance disapproves of them. That is in the Unitarians' favor. I wish I could say only good things of the Christian Church, but I couldn't do it without lying. And I believe it is better to tell the truth and let the Church do the lying. A male trinity is repulsive. Father, mother, and child is the sacred triad. And Frederick Douglass told Marilla that he prayed for 15 years for liberty. No prayer was answered until he prayed with his legs. That is, he ran away from bondage. At a time when there was no divorce or child support laws, a woman whose husband left the family